all yours. Okay, so I'll start by introducing our um, panelists today. We have Tanya Jackson is the Senior Vice President and Chief Product Delivery Officer for Lexmark International. She is also responsible for hardware and supplies development, supply chain manufacturing, and service delivery. We also have joining us today, Sharon Vital is Senior Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer for Lexmark International. Her global organization attracts develop attracts, develops, and engages Les Lexmark's most valuable resource, its employees, through talent development, strategic communications, compensation and benefits, workforce analytics, and diverse, diver sorry, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I have been a Girl Scout since kindergarten. My name is Katie Hardesty. And with that, I think we'll start our panel questions. So tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. We'll start with you, Tanya. All right, thank you, Katie. I'll, be, I'll, t I'll start with a, a little bit about my college background. I, I went to college as a, and I graduated as a chemistry major. And um, uh, I've always liked math and science. So it was a, a, an interesting field for me. I spent much of my career in what we call research and development, which is researching and designing new products, and uh, then moved over to, to the operations or supply chain part of the business. So you take those few parts that you develop in, in the lab, and then you figure out how to mass produce those and keep those out in the field for our customers and make sure that our customers' needs are served and, um, uh, and, and that we, uh, we you know, we, we kind of make sure that between the customer and work with the business, make sure Lexmark's needs are served. I am uh, married also, and I have three daughters, uh, all of who went, you know, who were in Girl Scouts. So I sold a lot of, I didn't, I didn't sell, but I helped a lot of Girl Scout cookie sales in my day. Thank you. That's very interesting. I know myself, I am more of a math and science person. Um, Sharon? Okay, well, I'll, I'll follow what uh, Tanya did. And so I am a University of Kentucky graduate. Um, I will start by saying that I, I have a degree in accounting, but when I first started in college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so for those of you that, that you know, reached that and not sure what you want to do, that's okay. Um, so, you know, I thought I was going to do nursing. I thought I was going to do environmental science. Uh, and then uh, when I went to UK, I wanted to find something that I knew that, um, you know, I wanted to have some stability from a career perspective. And so I wanted to go into the business world. I didn't want to go into marketing. And so I went to an accounting class and it just clicked. I enjoyed it. Uh, so math oriented uh, and it made sense to me. And so that's where I decided that I would go into the accounting field. Well, when I graduated, uh, Lexmark was hiring because we were a new company. And so I was in the accounting organization for 13 years. And then I had an opportunity to move over into human resources. And so I took that op opportunity, uh, went into compensation and benefits, and then am now in my role, you know, 17 years later. As far as family, I have two children. Uh, I have a daughter and a son, and my daughter uh, was also in Girl Scouts and sold uh, cookies, but I'd have to say I, I've eaten more Girl Scout cookies than we probably sold. So, so that's about me. Very interesting. Okay, so the next question is, if you could live anywhere, where would it be and why? We'll start with uh, you, Sharon, this time. Okay, I have to say that I love traveling. So I would, I can't think of one place that I would want to live because I love to, to see lots of places. I've lived in Kentucky almost all of my life. If you had asked me in high school that I would be, I've lived in Georgetown and in Lexington. If you had asked me in high school, are you going to live in one place your entire life? I would have said you'd be crazy. Uh, but Lexmark gave me the opportunity to live in one place, but also travel and, and actually, you know, fill that love of travel. So I guess if I'd live anywhere, it's in Kentucky because that's where I've been most of my life. I like that answer. Um, now you, Tanya. 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Sharon's a, a very similar. We've I've, I wasn't born in Kentucky. I lived in I was born in North Carolina, but I do like living in Kentucky. And as Sharon said, we both work at Lexmark, which is a global company, so we get to travel quite a bit, uh, both to meet employees because we have suppliers or customers. So we do get to travel a lot. And I, my, for me, the place that I would like the, the place where that I've, I I enjoy visiting the most is uh, my home, North Carolina. And so um, it's just a, a it, it, I'm from a very small town. And when I go, when I return to that town, it's just like, I'm, I've never left it. Uh, people are very, they know, they know me, I know them, those, it, it's just back home. North Carolina has a lot of mountains and beaches and those kinds of things. So I like to visit. It's, cha- you know, we've, I've grown, my kids have grown. So Kentucky is now home, but that's the place that I, I really like to visit just because it's just fundamental to, to who I am. That's a very good answer. Um, what would you describe as your a perfect day? Uh, I'll pass the microphone off to you, Tanya. Yeah, this is going to be a really lazy answer here. So I would say like waking up at a leisurely time, no alarm clock, let's start there. And taking a just a stroll, just a kind of a long walk, do a little exercising because I do like to exercise. Then kind of a casual brunch, lunch, you know, with friends and uh, just kind of hanging out with people, just, you know, have, having good conversations, no, no real pressure. I am a huge uh, sports fan, so I may throw in either some uh, games on TV or maybe attending some kind of sporting events, but, but just hanging out with friends and doing it with no particular schedule in mind. Very interesting. Um, Sharon? What- okay. So I, I'm going to steal a little bit of Tanya's. I agree with the no schedule um, and being around people that you enjoy, being around people that make you laugh, that you can laugh with, uh, that you can have a good experience with, um, and just just having a good time connecting with other people that you care about. Now, as far as the sports, I'd have to leave that out. Um, but as long as I was with people that I cared about and we were having a good time watching the sports, I would do that. Yeah. Um, I know I've never been much of a sports person myself, but I know it can be very enjoyable with friends. Yes. yes. As long as the team you're cheering for is winning too. That's an important piece. Yeah. Okay. How do you balance your career, personal life, and passions? We'll start with you, Sharon. Um, so I've had a long career. Um, you know, I've been at Lexmark for 31 years. And I would tell you that over that time, the demands on your life change over time. Um, so that, you know, when I had young children, um, I was also, you know, moving up in my career you know, the the passions kind of fall to the wayside when you're, you know, having to focus on the kids. You know, as your kids get older, uh, then you can devote a little more, more time to your passions. And, and the career is still there because you're still focusing on that. Um, so, so what I would say when people ask me, how do you balance things? Um, you have to come to the realization that you can't do it all. And so you have to figure out at this particular time in your life, what are the things that you need to do? Because, you know, you've got, you know, I was a caregiver for my children when they were young, but I was also a caregiver for my parents when they needed that. And so you have to look at what are the demands of your life and know that in certain times you have to give up one thing to focus on another but life is long, hopefully for all of us. And so those passions, you get to integrate those back in as your time allows. But I will also say that you do have to have downtime to be able to deal with stress. So even though you've got career, personal life and passions, you also have to think about mental health and you have to focus on how to have time where you don't have so much stress. It's a very interesting answer. I know it's important for all of us um, to, like you said, especially put time for mental health. Um, what about you, Tanya? Now, that was a terrific answer, Sharon. It's very complete uh, because I, you know she's exactly right. We, 
we the term work life balance people hear it and they feel like it's a weight like it's you know it's perfectly balanced and it just never is and, and as you know as sharon said it's a matter of different stages in your life you may you know have to be pulled in one direction versus another um you know a, a big aspect of that is being honest with yourself about where where is my priority now and um especially in the workplace it's really important to communicate that because you know your boss or your coworkers they're not mind readers and if it's something that's going on in your life that pulls you in a different direction we all have to be honest about that and say you know what i I've, i can do this project and i'm going to focus on this but when this is done i need i have I have another passion, another priority over here that I have to go work on. And similarly with your, your family as well, everybody, you know, I, Sharon and I are very similar. We had, uh, we were working with young kids. And so you, everybody's in on this. This is the, you know, the spouse, the, the, the neighbor, the, the other parents in the, in the carpool, everybody's helping. And so it, it's, it's a matter of making, have communicating what you need from people at a time because you can't, do it all as, as Sharon mentioned mental health is also acknowledging you know all of us think to some degree we're super women and we can just do it all and you can't and but knowing that there's always there are people that are willing to help but they you have to tell them you have to you have to be very open that I need help doing this or doing that so I you know when we talk about work-life balance you know again Sharon said it, this it's a compromise it's a at this time in my life I need to do this and now I'm this is different things have changed it's not the same. You, you don't have to be on one path and say this is the way it's always going to be. Things change, so now this is my this is this is my focus. But it's really about being honest with yourself about where you are, what you need to do, and, and acknowledging that you do need downtime. You do need to, to take care of yourself. And most of all, you cannot, as much as you want to do it all, you can't. You can't do it all. I like that. As I've gotten older, I have also realized that life the stages of life do mean you have to like the balance does change and oh. i've learned that as i've gotten older so i like that answer yeah, and, and as, as you get as old as sharon and i it, it, it will even be more clear <laughs> <laughs> okay tanya what motivated you to step up and become a leader in the organization um so for me it as I, I said in my introduction, I spent a lot of my time in R and D research and development, and I enjoyed, um, I'd say, laboratory work. I enjoyed, um, you know, learning things, uh, real things happening in front of me. So I actually stayed in a technical role for for, for quite a while because I really enjoyed that that, you know, that it was very fulfilling for me. And as I began, you know, as when you're in an organization. Um, you start taking on more responsibilities and you start being team leaders and you start doing those types of things. Um, and I started observe. I, I was able to work with different, for different people, different managers. And, and as a part of that, I was learning on the job of the style of leadership that I liked, the things that some managers did better than others. There was always something you can take from everybody from a learning perspective. But, but the trigger for me to go into management was First of all, we, it's interesting, we talked about this, when my children, my youngest two uh, went to first grade, then I had uh, kind of a reliable work day for a school day for them. They, you know, at a certain time, they had the after school care. So I had some stability there and uh, they were happy in their schools. And so it was like, okay, this is a really good time. That was one of the triggers. The other was a, a manager that I had worked with before really there was an opening in his area and I applied because I I know I knew him well the, the, the area was very interesting to me it was still very technical very interesting to me um, and, and I, I was going to be starting something new and I knew it was going to be uh, different learning and I wanted to work with somebody that would tell me the truth um, like how, how am I doing do I, what, what do I need to improve on not somebody that was going to just say okay you know yes it's okay you need to work on it but he was just very direct in a in a kind way, not direct in a you know tearing down way, but I knew he would push me to say, I know you're new here, but you still need to do this, this, and this. So it was a it was a comfort level um, with him as a person, and also with him as a coach and mentor to me. So that that was when I really started down the leadership path, and from there, um, you know, we went. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about this later, but it became getting out of my comfort zone that was more important for leadership first part I say was managing and then going outside of my space and really learning new things and learning new people 
and, and taking all of those opportunities to, to have continued uh, broader, broader assignments was, uh, was, was one of my biggest stepping stones. Thank you. Um, what about you, Sharon? Uh, what motivated you to become a leader in the organization? So I think my path is very different. Uh, when I talk about that I went to college, what I didn't say is that I went to college. My four-year degree took me eight years to get. Uh, so I was a non-traditional student. And so one of the reasons was because I worked full time while I was getting my college degree. And so I was the manager of a small business. It was called Dance Biz. We sold dance and exercise clothing. And so I enjoyed that aspect of, of helping run a business. And so, you know, I got to be the manager, I got to be the bookkeeper, I got to do all the things, order things. So I enjoyed being involved and seeing how you could manage the business. So when I graduated um, from the University of Kentucky and went to Lexmark, uh, it wasn't very long. Uh, it was four years, I believe, before I became a manager. And it was because of that experience that I had when I was in college. And so what I had always focused on, you know, when I started at, at Lexmark, when I was in the accounting organization, Lexmark encourages, encouraged you to think about short-term and long-term goals. And since, since I was new to my career, it was like long-term goal, okay, well, I wanna be head of US accounting, right? Throw out a big goal out there. And so it, it took me, I can't remember off the top of my head, um, probably eight years, 10 years to get to that role. But it, it was more I was focused on doing the best that I could do in the role that I was in and trying to learn a lot and trying to understand because I have a very curious nature. And so just asking questions led to more and more responsibilities that then let me move into HR because that was something completely different. And um, being open to new opportunities, being open to learning gave me new opportunities. I was able to move to Kansas City, City for 18 months uh, because Lexmark had um, acquired, and that means you know, buying new companies, I had to go and assimilate, uh, bring those employees into Lexmark. And so just, being open to opportunities um, led to a path where I got to be um, in this position that I'm at now as a leader at Lexmark. It was because uh, I enjoyed um, new challenging things. I had an inquisitive nature and I always tried to push myself to do the best that I could. I really like your answer and I like what you said about your experience in college with helping manage a small business or managing a small business um, helped you in later life. I really like that answer because sometimes a hands-on experience is just as good, if not sometimes better than a traditional education. I like that. Um, so Sharon, uh, what does leadership mean to you and what is your leadership style? Tanya talked about manager versus leader. Um, and I'm not going to say too much because she's probably going to talk about it too. Um, you know, manager is somebody that, you know, is more task oriented, somebody that, that focuses on, you know, are you doing A, are you doing B, are you doing C, um, and, and helping people, you know, with their, their daily things. Um, leaders are beyond that. Leaders are um, inspirational. Leaders, um, the best leaders are ones that listen, uh, ones that um, not only view things from their own um, sphere of, of influence, but try to look beyond uh, and try to be um, empathetic and understanding of what other people go through. And um, my leadership style, what I would say is that it, it evolves. You know, when you first become a manager, you know, it takes a while to realize if you want to move up in the organization that you need to be a leader. Um, and my leadership style, it's something you have to work on. You know, you don't, you don't reach a, 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 a point and say, I've made it, I, I don't have to change uh, because the environment changes. 
um, you know, nobody would have believed um, that, that we would have gone through COVID. And so, you know, leadership has changed dramatically over the last, you know, three, four years. Uh, leaders have had to be more empathetic. Uh, that means uh, listening to people. That means caring about what they're feeling and what they're thinking, not just telling people what to do. But you also have a, a business to run. And so you also have to think about what's going on from a business perspective and you have to weigh, you know, what's going on with your employees, what are they thinking, but then what do you need to deliver from an organizational standpoint? Um, so I, I, it's hard to say you have one style because you have to do many different things at many different times. And so you, I'd say my leadership style over time has been that I have to be adaptable. I have to be adaptable, but I also have to, to listen to people. And I also have to focus on not just my piece. Um, and I, I will say, I'm going to throw kudos out to Tanya. You know, she's one of the best leaders at Lexmark as far as being collaborative. Um, she's fantastic at that. So I'm going to stop and let her talk about her leadership style because she's pretty phenomenal. Well, geez, Sharon, thank you for that. Sharon's pretty phenomenal too. She's our, uh, she keeps all of us well educated and pushed out there for, from an HR perspective and trying to make sure we're learning things. So I'm gonna go ahead and take the question. Katie, is that okay? That question, it was about leadership. You know, Sharon hit it with the, the manager versus leader. And just at a, you know, actually Sharon may not remember, we had this conversation, I don't know, a couple of months ago. And it was about, you know, what, what is your job kind of in a nutshell. And it was about, you know, setting the strategy and aligning with the strategy and a big part of leadership. And we both talked about it, but I want to be really intentional here is developing a team, um, really developing a high performing, your, you know, a best, your, the best team you possibly can, which means that's the big part of leadership is that people talk about servant leadership or, or they, 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 there's various names for it, but you, we're here to really make the team better and, and help that team grow. And then the last part of it is being a part of something impactful from a customer and a business perspective. Like, you know, that's what Sharon also talked about. You got a business to run. Uh, so it's making sure that, um, you know, that, that we actually are, are getting results. And, you know, from a style perspective, that's, that's a, it, it's, 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 some of it is what you may think your style is versus what other people would say your style is. So it's, it could, and, and hopefully they're close, but, but it's always good as a leader to, to stay in touch with um, the team to make sure that we, we are listening, that we may think we're good listeners, but you ask those questions. You know, we do surveys and those kinds of things that Sharon's group runs to, 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 to ask people, how are you feeling? What are you, are, is, as, as, as managers, are we being, are we listening to people? So I like to think I'm collaborative. Um, and, and a part of it is the roles that I've had over, over the years. You just, you know, some people think if you're a leader of an organization, you just snap your fingers and things happen. That's just not the way it does. That's not the way it works. And if it does, that's a problem because, because you really don't want, you want to get input. You want people, you want to talk to people to say, well, I'm, this, is, this is our problem or this is our opportunity, but to get as much feedback as you possibly can. Doesn't mean you're going to take all the feedback, but it does help you make a better decision and it does help uh, get people aligned and it builds that inspiration, you know, that Sharon was talking about. And Lexmark is, is a special place. And I think Sharon hit it about being adaptive. I think every leader at Lexmark is change adaptive, whether they're not, you know, leaders for long because it, things happen so fast. And it's not that we're changing things. Sometimes we are, but the world changes, right? And customers change and business change. And Sharon, Sharon mentioned COVID. So I like to think that I can get over things. Um, doesn't mean I'm not gonna whine for a little while, but then I can say, okay, this is, this is what I have to go do. And um, let's make a decision and go. Um, I like to believe, and Sharon talked about listening, I, again, it's a style thing that I hope is true from if you ask you know, people on the team, I like to believe I'm approachable because part of listening is being approachable. Like if, if people don't think they can talk to you, they're, they're not gonna talk to you. So therefore you don't have an opportunity to listen. So you, you have to make sure that you are um, extending uh, either the literally saying, hey, come talk, I'm, I'm interested in hearing this or that, or it can be way less formal, a, a hall conversation in the cafeteria you bump into somebody and people will tell you things whether you 
are specifically asking about a project or anything. So people have to believe that leaders are approachable. Uh, and I, and I like to, I, I would like to believe that. And then, um, the other part of it is I, I, I get a lot of joy out of mentoring and, and growing an organization. And, and that is the biggest part of leadership. If you're not, if you don't really want to deal with people, it's just not the job for you because that is the entire job. And, and it's fun. And we, we haven't talked about this, but there is a fun element of leadership. Uh, some days are, you know, better than others, but if you can't laugh at yourself, that's, that's a problem. And some of the, some of the, uh, uh, some of the things that happen, you just have to just put your, you know, put your hand in your, you know, your head and just laugh and say, this is uh, this has been quite a day, but I think being approachable, being collaborative and in any industry, especially the way the world is right now, being change adaptive. And that looks different for every, for everybody, but not being stuck or saying, I know this is the way that we need to go and, and or either I've made this decision and I'm not going to change my mind. New information requires that you change your mind, that you say, yep, I was wrong about this, or I learned new information. So um, this, it's, it's um, but, but I'll tell you, let's go back to style is what, the way we think we are, but it's always good to, to, to ask people in your organization, what is my style? Or what do you think my style? Or what can I do better to, to, to help with my style? That's a very interesting answer. And I really like the thing you said about adaptability because it is so important to be able to change, to meet what needs to be done and what people need. I really like that. So, Tanya, is there a particular leader you look up to and why? You know, there's a, there are a lot of people. I might, yeah, so there's a lot of... Um, I, I, I thought about this for a little bit. There's, there's a lot of people I could go from, you know, literally my mother, who's, who I will always look up to as, a, as, a, as my first leader. But uh, in terms of uh, who someone may, may, may know and relate to, I thought about um, Judge Ginsburg. And, and, I, and the reason uh, that I'm, I'm bringing her up and is because, you know, from what I've read about, obviously I, I look at it from a distance, but she seemed to work well with people who clearly they had disagreement. They were on, they, they didn't, they didn't agree on everything, but they became friends. Uh, they had good conversations about, um, you know, fact-based conversations. And so I, 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 I admire people because it goes back to what I aspire to be as collaborative. And I felt like she, I, she when I look at her as a couple of things is that I don't necessarily have to agree with you, but I really, I can still have a friendship with you. I can still have, we can go out to dinner. We can do those kinds of things. Um, and then the, the second part of her, though, is that I believe she always had courage whenever there was a, a, an opportunity or when um, her position was asked. It may be different from someone else's, but this was my position. And it, but it wasn't at the risk of tearing down somebody else's position. I think that's, that's really important for me is that I can, I can believe what I believe is right, but that doesn't mean that you are you are wrong, you know? So I, I, I feel like uh, that's somebody that I, that I admire her style. Katie, you're on mute, sorry. Thank you for telling me that. I know it's very important to be able to still be friendly and considerate and uh, not disrespectful to people, even when you disagree with them. I really think that is a very great quality, being able to respectfully disagree. Um, so Shannon, what about your answer? Yeah, you know, for me, it's hard. You know, I can't point to one particular leader that, 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 that I view as the ultimate leader. I think it's more about what are the leadership traits that I admire? And Tanya, you know, talked a lot about him about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that she was collaborative. She, uh, you know, approached things from an intellectual perspective. I'm an emotional person. You know, you, you're either an emotional person or an intellectual person at your core, I believe. And so I approach things more from an emotional perspective first, but then, you know, no, I've got data to back it up. Tanya's laughing because she knows it's true. Um, so I, I really respect people that are more, um, uh, can be very calm in the face of, of adversity and calm in the face of, of things that are very trying. 
Um, and, and there's multiple leaders that, that are, have that ability, but then also being collaborative and reaching across, helping um, people understand different points of view. Um, there, there's people here at Lexmark that, that do that. Tanya is somebody that I respect uh, quite a bit. Brock Saladin is somebody that I respect quite a bit. These are people that I deal with on a daily basis that are very strong leaders. And, and so that, those are the people that, that I look up to. Very good answer. And um, yeah, it for me, it is mostly the qualities because um, I look up to a bunch of different people and I like the qualities that they all have mostly, along with the actual people. But and I think Dolly Parton's pretty cool. <laughs> okay. Um, Sharon, in 2021, 26% of all CEOs and managing directors were women. How did you get to your position today, and did you experience any obstacles along the way? So, um, I think I've already talked about kind of how I got here, right? I talked about, you know, college, I talked about different things. I think that the obstacles that, that come in your way um, are, some of those are your own internal obstacles. Um, some of those are, you know, focusing on, um, I call it the voice inside your head that kind of, that kind of talks to you and says, oh, you know, you didn't do this the right way or you didn't do that the right way. And so so some of the obstacles are your own internal making. And so you have to learn how to shut those obstacles down. Um, the other obstacle that, that I had to overcome was being comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, because Tanya alluded to this a little bit uh, earlier, that when you get outside of your comfort zone, that is really when you challenge yourself the most. And when you're able to kind of figure out what are you made of and how can you progress in something that you don't know anything about. Uh, and so I alluded to the fact that, you know, I moved to Kansas City for 18 months. Well, I left my family in Kentucky and I went somewhere where I didn't even know anybody and uh, went there by myself, had to integrate myself into uh, an organization. And uh, I learned a lot, uh, but that obstacle was getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, you know, in, in college, um, you know, it took me eight years to get a four-year degree. That was an obstacle uh, because I worked full-time. I remember a professor, you know, I, I thought about getting a master's in, um, in accounting and he knew I was going slow and he said, you're going to be a little old lady before you ever get a master's degree. Well, I didn't get my master's degree, but I did get my college degree and I went on to get my CPA. So, you know, I did more than what, you know, he, he had indicated that I could do. Um, so, so I think um, the obstacles are, are things that you have to push yourself and figure out how to get beyond. Now, you know, other people have greater obstacles that they have to deal with, but for me, it was, you know, how do, how do I shut down that negative voice in my head and continue to push myself? And um, that, that's what I've had to look at. Thank you, Sharon. Um, and Tanya? So we talked a little bit about the kind of leadership journey and, and Sharon talked about it as is I, we talk about this thing called leaving your comfort zone, just so everybody on the call kind of gets a, a visual of what that looks like. It's, it's going, it's working in an area, let's say you were trained, let's, in Sharon's case, accounting, in my case, you know, any, any kind of technical area, but, and then asked to go lead in a very different area where people, the people that you're leading, they have the expertise, you don't. That's, that's what the, the, the lack of comfort zone means. But what you bring to that is um, a leadership style, all the qualities that you know we, we've talked about before you bring and you bring your background to it. So you're bringing a different perspective. You're, you're bringing knowledge from a different part of the business. And that's one of the cool things about Lexmark is that we, we really do try to mix people across boundaries and across organizations so that everybody has an appreciation for the value that another organization has. Because if you don't do that, then you grow up and you work and you think that your group is, you know, that 
we know everything. And so you go outside of those organizations and you say, oh, we're working with smart people all around and learn all of those kind of challenges. And so for me, that was one of the biggest um, leadership growth opportunities for me and because it was a situation of working with a team that I, I didn't know the people well, um, and I certainly didn't know the content well. But what I had to learn how to do was ask questions, uh, rely on their um, expertise, and find those people that were willing to teach me. So you're, you're, you're the leader of an organization, but you're going to people and saying, hey, I don't understand this, I don't understand that, do you have time? And, and that's how you earn their respect. It's not about the title or where you are on an org chart. That, that matters very little in terms of, of gaining uh, organizational respect. So I think that once you do that once, um, it's really hard the first time, after the second time, it's, it's still, it's equally as hard, but you know how to do it. You, you, what I, I say is you learn how to learn uh, because it's like, oh, I've been here before. I'm same situation. I don't know anything, but I know how to figure this out. And your confidence gets you know better. And I think that's one of the obstacles for, um, for women. And I don't, I, is that I, I believe sometimes we are hesitant to take new roles because we focus on the skills that we don't have. We, we don't, we, and we, and, and it's true, I'm not saying we don't have them, but we focus on what we don't have versus what we bring to the role. And we, we spend too much time um, explaining what, why we shouldn't do it because I don't know how to do this, I don't know how to do that, I don't, you know, all of these things. And, and I think that's, that is, get, has, is getting better. And I think having more women in leadership helps other women get past that. It's a natural thing. I'm not, we all have it, I've done it. Um, but I think it's just important for us to say, to believe in ourselves, you bet on yourself that you will figure it out. Sure, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that, but I'll figure it out. And I'll go, I'll go off and work on it. That's what one of the obstacles that I, that I think is, is out there for women. And the other one is that sometimes, most of the times, you will be the only woman in the room. Um, that's getting better as well. And there's some, there's some dynamics around that. It, it, it kind of, um, um, I think, I think, the, I think that, that trend will hopefully continue to change, but until it does, you have to be comfortable being the only woman in the room and still finding your way and finding uh, uh, all, and, and, and working through all of the things just like everybody else in the room and saying, I belong. So that's, the, that's my counter to the being, you, you will be the only woman in the room or maybe it's two, but you still have to believe you belong and that uh, along the way, as while you're that one in the room, you, your job is to help others get to the room. And, and even if they don't want to be in the room, but, but just to help people along their journey, whatever their journey is, wherever, wh whatever it is, you, we have that opportunity to help, to help other women. So that's my view on obstacles. Thank you, Tanya. And that kind of brings us into our next question. What are the benefits to having women in leadership? Oh, uh, we'll start with you, Sharon. Um, I think that some of the things that we've already talk, talked about, um, because Tanya and I are women, and so we talk about some of the things that we think are our natural traits, and, and some of those are because we're women. Right. I think that we're more adaptable. I think that, that women are more adaptable. I think women um, tend to try to figure out how to make things happen faster uh, than being stuck in, you know, what was because you're, you're constantly trying to balance and trying to figure out how to do things. Um, so I think we're more change adaptable. Uh, I think that um, you know, there has been times in my career when you know, I was so busy and stressed out that I didn't listen as much as I should have. But I think that that when we can slow down, women have a tendency to, to listen and want to be um, empathetic and understanding a, a situation better. Uh, and so those are the types of traits um, that in an ever changing world um, are important. Those are fundamental things to help you be able to, to progress and move an organization forward. Okay, thank you. Um, Tanya? I'll build on what Sharon said, just as based on who we are as, uh, you know, women are just wired a little bit differently. I, I, from what I see, um, from my perspective, I think we can call out a problem faster. In, in other words, um, so I had a, uh, I, one of my former managers was a female. And she had a saying uh, about identifying problems. 
and she said everybody wants to identify a problem, stare at it, look at it, but nobody wants to fix the problem. So it was it's a matter of not blaming anybody, but just saying this is something that needs to be fixed, and it, it, and let's go figure out how to do that. Um, so I think women have a are are, little, are are faster at not dwelling too much on how in the world did this happen. It's like that just needs to be fixed, and let's just go off and fix it, and and putting the teams around that focusing there versus on how do we get here anyway and who's to blame and all of that business. Let's, let's just go fix the problem. And the other thing, and um, I think, you know, Sharon hit on it. I think we can get to, and there's a, we, we, we may have uh, strong opinions on things, but we can get to compromise and agreement faster because sometimes the, agree, the, the solution means somebody's got, it, almost always it means somebody has to give and take and, 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 but that doesn't really matter if we can solve the problem. And, and I think that's a, that's just a trait from a perspective of where we're coming from, because we're just looking at it differently as, you know, as Sharon said, it's something that we haven't maybe seen before. And it's like, I just know it needs to be fixed. And it's not, it's not your solution, my solution, let's just find the best solution. And, and I think we can do that quickly and get over it. it. Goes back to the change adaptability and go on to the next thing. So I think that's 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 one of the benefits, you know, of having women in leadership. And the other thing that's obvious is that uh, we just see things differently. And so if there's a, I don't know if there's a new strategy or if there's some some, um, um, especially if there's a new strategy, it's a perspective of well, let's think about that a minute. You you're not you think you look at everything just differently. You don't necessarily change the strategy, but you take other things into account that other people might not even think about because it just it's just not. It's just not something that they that comes to. It's not something that a man would come to a man's mind. Once you point it out, and Sharon will agree with. I think she'll agree with this. They'll be like, "Oh yeah, I wouldn't even thought about that." Nobody's mad about it. Just like I just, it's just a different way that people think. And I think that goes back to having the courage to speak up. You're going to be the only one in the room. Men are going to miss it. Not not because there's any malicious intent. It's just because it's just not the way they think. And so your job is to say, "Okay, hey, did you all think about this? This is what I'm." This is what I'm thinking about and have that discussion. And in the process, everybody starts to get better at that, thinking about things from a different perspective. Thank you, Tanya. Okay, so the next question is, have you ever felt you have been perceived or treated differently as a leader because you are a woman? And if so, how did you handle that experience? We'll start with you, Tanya. You're on mute, Tanya. Uh, yep, I was getting just getting off getting off mute. Um, you know, I'm gonna be. This is a one that I think is. Um, it's not so much about um, a particular aspect of of, of a problem or anything, but I think from for women, one of our challenges is feedback, honest feedback. Uh, because I think sometimes if, if you have a male leader, I think if you have a female leader, it's a little different dynamic completely. But uh, I think historically men have not um, given quick constructive feedback. And, and what by constructive, I mean, if you presented something in a meeting, they you know come back and say, hey, this was good, but you know this could have been a little bit better or we could have talked this way. I think there's a there, there has historically been a hesitancy to say, well, I don't know how she'll take it. And well, is she going to be, is this going to be a problem or... I don't want to feel like I'm picking on the woman or anything like that. But what that if you don't get that feedback, then you don't get to fix anything. You don't get to correct anything quickly. And, and so I think the way we all get better, whether you're in leadership or whatever, it doesn't really matter, is that if people are willing to help you to say, this is what you did really well, this is what, or if you did this just a little bit better, this would be more effective. And if you can't get to that, this would be more effective. So if you can't get that insight, you're just going to be slower. You can get there, but it's just going to be a little bit slower. So I, 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 I encourage women to always ask for feedback, like legitimately ask for feedback. Don't say something like, how'd I do? Just say, I want some feedback on this, on this meeting. And you can't walk away with somebody saying, it was great. Everything's good. Everything that we do is not always good. It doesn't. So you should, the feedback discussion should be like, hey, can you just tell me one thing that I could do better? And this, I just, you, you saw me do this. Tell me one thing I want to get better at. And that eases that whole tension of, well, I don't know if I should tell her or not. And then the way you receive that, hopefully very positively, if it's delivered very positively, then that becomes a natural reaction. And then you don't have to, you don't have to encourage that feedback. It becomes a natural thing for you to get because they know that you're seeking, your manager knows you're seeking feedback. 
you gotta listen, you gotta respond. So I, I just think that's one thing that I I I try to push all the the myelin organization is feedback, especially for women, because they want to know. We all want to know, but if you don't, if you don't tell us, we're not going to get better as fast. We'll still figure it out because we're, you know, we're women. We'll figure it out, but it's just not going to be as be as fast. Thank you, Tanya. Um, what about you, Sharon? Yeah, you know, I have been very, very fortunate in my career because Lexmark uh, values diversity, but I've also been in organizations that have been predominantly women. Uh, I start, started out in the accounting organization, and when I was in the accounting organization, the head of the accounting organization was a woman, uh, and there were multiple female managers. Um, and then I moved over to HR. HR is predominantly uh, women in the organization, uh, and we've had female leaders uh, in the organization. So, so within those groups, you know, people that were deciding on, you know, the progression of my career, I, I haven't had as much um, being treated differently because I was a woman there. Now, sometimes I would go into meetings, you know, Tanya talks about being the only woman in the room. I remember early on in my career, you know, going into meetings and being the only woman. And um, so, so there is a little bit of, of, at that time, times have changed a little bit, not 100%, but they've changed a little bit where maybe people didn't take your opinion as seriously. And so you really needed to know what you were talking about. Um, you know, you had to address things with facts. Uh, and you had to, you know, demonstrate that you had a knowledge of what you were discussing. Um, and, you know, we, I had to work very hard to, to not say in meetings, I feel this. Um, you know, I had to really think about, you know, what I wanted to talk about. Now, times have changed a little bit. And, you know, I, I don't worry as much about saying I feel because, you know, that's the way I am. Um, I think more, you know, it's some of the things that I've experienced outside of Lexmark uh, being treated differently as a woman. You know, I know when I was trying to buy my first car, you know, somebody kept asking when my husband was going to uh, come and, and and work on the on the deal. And I just I voiced my opinion to that person and I ended up buying my car from another dealership. And so it's not just within uh, work, you know, you do experience those things outside of work and, and it's about, you know, being confident, knowing what you know and, and not accepting being treated differently because you're a woman. That applies within work or outside of work. Thank you, Sharon. Okay. Um, as a leader, how do you stay mindful of who's at the table and who's missing? Sharon, we'll start with you. As I said before, I, I'm very fortunate that I work at a company that is focused on uh, diversity and inclusion. And so we are constantly uh, talking as an executive team and talking uh, uh, you know, to our managers about making sure that we have diversity. And so when we look at any of our, 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 our leadership programs, uh, any of our compensation programs, uh, we're constantly making sure that we have uh, diversity, whether it's gender, ethnicity, we're looking at making sure that we have uh, people at the table and participating in opportunities that can help them grow. Now, Tanya's more, you know, on the street, you know, trying to make sure. And so I'm going to turn it over to her because I'm more in charge of the programs themselves and making sure that we're, you know, having the right representation in the programs. Okay, Sharon, had, that's a new term for me. I'm on the street. Okay. <laughs> What's a better term for you? <laughs> I don't know. I'll, I'll go with that. Okay. You know, the Sharon, Sharon's right. We do a really good job at, at Lexmart of doing our best to try to, to, to make sure we have um, diverse um, voices at, at in, in, in across the organization with every opportunity. So what I, I, what I want to talk about is that when when you're at the table that you make there's a there's a there's some extra effort that as a leader you make to make sure that the voices that are at the table are heard and included because this is not so much male female but different people communicate differently some people are jumping in conversations really easily and then some people just like to just need a minute to think about something that's said and they don't 
And then, you know, about the time that they process and they're ready to talk, something is gone, the, the subject is moved to something different, or the other person has jumped back in the conversation and they can't talk. So I think one of the things that we try to do here um, is make sure that we, we pause, give a break in the meeting to say, hey, so what do you think, Sharon? I haven't heard from you. And not because um, Sharon doesn't have thoughts, but maybe her, you know, she's just thinking about something. That's usually not a case for Sharon. She's, she's always got thoughts. So she's always <laughs> jumping in, but I'm using her as an example. But I think the personality, again, whether it's male or female, in a group dynamic setting is really tough. And, and as a leader, you want to make sure, because the person is not talking, may have the information that you need to avoid making a really bad decision or to do, do something too fast, too slow, whatever it will be. So you want, the person is at, in, is at the table for a reason, that's knowledge. So you gotta pull that knowledge out of them in a way that's comfortable for them. And then and, and they'll get more and more comfortable speaking. And then you also have to help the people that are jumping in understand they're not getting, it's not like, you know, you don't get points for words per minute of how much you're talking in the meeting. It's, it's a matter of say something that's really important but you don't have to fill all of the airtime to give other people a chance to talk. So there's that group dynamics that has to go on, whether it's male or female. So once you, you, you get the right people at the table, I think we all have to work on making sure, again, that people feel comfortable speaking up. First of all, there's no fear, uh, but beyond, sometimes there is no fear, there's just personality. And, and we gotta make sure that people are, um, are pulled into the conversation sometime, even if they're at the table. Yeah, and Kate, Katie, can I just circle back and say, you know, one thing that Tanya said earlier that she's really good at is going back afterwards and talking to people and saying, hey, you were in that meeting, you know, why didn't you say anything? Or, you know, you you ha had a lot to bring to the table. And so it's that mentoring uh, that she does a really good job at of talking to people. And then also, you know, talking to other leaders and explaining to them why it's so important, why it's so important to have diversity of thought and, and different views at the table. And so holding your peers or holding other people accountable for making sure that they are doing the same thing so that it is a welcoming environment for all voices. Thank you. Um, so our last question is, what do you believe will be the biggest challenge for the next generation of female leaders behind you? And what advice would you give them? Tanya, we'll start with you. Okay, I'll be brief on this one. Sharon talked about the voice in your head. I think it will continue. That's just who we are. We, we, um, we, we, we have uh, that self-doubt and, and we'll, we, will all, we, we will all work through it. But my, encourage, my, my words of uh, encouragement to the women or the, the young ladies here on the call is to don't sell yourself short. Um, believe in yourself and believe, admit you, I mean, be eyes wide open. I'm not saying be, um, uh, think you can do things that you cannot. That's the cool thing about women. We, we have high self-awareness. We know what we can do or what we're capable of doing, but believe that even if you don't know how to do something, bet on yourself that you will figure it out, that there will always be people that will help and, and continue to grow your skill set, and don't self-select out of an opportunity because at this particular moment, you don't know how to do this one thing. Just believe in yourself and bet on yourself. Thank you. Tanya, um, Sharon? Yeah, this one, you know, the, 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 that answer is the broad answer for, for women in general, um, as far as, you know, making sure that, that you don't self-select because that voice in your head, because I, I know every time that I tried to move to different jobs, um, you know, I was telling somebody, I don't know if I can do it. It's so hard. And finally, this person said, you've said that the last three times you've changed jobs and you figured it out every time. And so until that person said that to me, the light bulb didn't go over my off that said, hey, you do figure this out. And then from that time on, I could have a little more confidence. Um, but I think the biggest challenge for the next uh, generation of female leaders, you know, from a more micro perspective is childcare. I think that that is a very, very tough thing um, that, that, you know, um, so what advice, uh, you know, talk to your, um, 
talk to your 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 legislature, talk to people. I mean, this is something that, that's a bigger issue um, that, that we as a society have to figure out. Uh, if you think about COVID, uh, people self-selected out of the workforce because of childcare issues. Uh, and so that is a societal thing that, that we have to tackle uh, in order for there to be more uh, female leaders at the table. Thank you. That was our last interview question. Um, Katie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Katie. And thank you, Tanya and Sharon. We really appreciate you all taking the time to be with us today um, and for sharing your personal stories and advice. I think you inspired everybody here on the call um, today. So thank you so much. Uh, and as always, Katie did a fantastic job leading the conversation. She did. So Great job, Katie. for being here. <laughs> Um, yes. We didn't have any um, one on, in the chat ask any questions. So that's all the questions we had today. Um, thank you all for being here. And this is recorded. Um, so if you had someone that wasn't able to attend, we will be posting that um, on our uh, Facebook page. So we invite you to share that with them um, and review this wonderful conversation we had today. Um, so thanks again and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya and Sharon, for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye.